Robert, uh, and here we did it in Canada. And today there's a group that will be speaking to you. We have Dr. Mike Taves, Mike Green, and he's a research entomologist. We also have Dr. Jason Schmidt. Uh, absolutely, we're going to spend the majority of time talking about what there are a lot of questions we you know. Uh, but before we get to white flies, I do have a couple things I want to share with you because I think they're very important for us to consider as we're moving forward. And primarily, I want to talk to you a little bit about BT cotton and kind of some things happening in other parts of the U.S. and something we need to be aware of in the state of Georgia. A lot of you have seen me speak before. You probably recognize this slide. I show it every time I make this presentation. And I really love showing pictures of Dr. Taves back in 2007. No gray hair. Young. Still learning cotton. But being successful in any business is about making good decisions. We're talking about insects and insect pest management. The only way we can make a good decision is to know what's in the field. So hire yourself a scout, hire yourself a consultant. Use thresholds if you have a problem, address it. Use a recommended product, something that'll do the job. Uh, but again, that's the best dollar you can spend in terms of insect pest management, hire a scout, hire a consultant. We do have a couple of scout schools each year. And of course, your county agent can help you or any of the to learn about scouting cotton, but we have one in Tipton. It's the second Monday every year, and then we have one uh, at the research station in Nittville. That's the third Tuesday every year. All right, but I want to talk to you uh, for about seven or eight minutes about some thoughts and uh, concerns we have relating to BT cotton. Number one, I want to talk to you about changes in susceptibility. And then we'll talk about, you know, if we have a problem with corn earworm in BT cotton, how are we going to address it? Just a little bit about the history of BT cottons. We've been planting BT cottons now for over 20 years. And what I've got is a little pictorial of the evolution of how we've added or stacked BT genes in the cotton varieties. Back in 1996, we had something, uh, a single gene BT cotton, that gene was CRY1AC. Over time, industry has stacked the second gene and even the last few years, we've stacked a third gene. Now, why have we added, or why did industry add genes to BT? Two reasons primarily. Number one, if we go back way back to the 90s when we planted Old Guard cotton like 555. It was not uncommon for us to spray corn earworm. It was not uncommon for us to spray soybean lupin. It was not uncommon for us to spray fall army worm. The second gene in increased efficacy on those target pests, made the activity much broader. The other reason we've added genes, or industry has added genes, is for resistance management. Now, but the original gene back in 1996 is still here, even in our three gene BT cottons. What we believe has happened is corn earworm has developed resistance to that gene. Okay? It's not working as well as it did initially. In the Mid-South states, they actually have <coughs> some suspicions of resistance to the second gene in Bogart 2. And these genes are different. The second genes are different between Bogart 2 and Bogart They're different. The second gene in Bogart is its strength is on all along. It's active on corn one, but it's a little, little bit weak. But the point here is, these things aren't working like they did several years ago. And where they're seeing the issues is not necessarily on the farm in Georgia. We can show you lab data where we have concerns, but it's in the Mid-South and it's up in North Carolina and Virginia, right? And one of the things I want to really stress is where we do see poor performance of BT traits in Georgia is in corn. A lot of pressure in corn, right? Basically the same genes. A lot of corn earworms funnel through a cornfield before they come to cotton. We know we see a slippage or whatever you want to call it for performance in our two gene BT corns. It's a major contributor to selection for resistance. 
So if you're a corn farmer, plan a refuge. In the South, you're supposed to plan 40% non dt refuge. That's going to help us on cotton. <coughs> I don't care if it's one gene, two gene, three gene, or five genes. <coughs> None of these BT cottons are immune to corn airworm. BT cottons require management. Uh, they require good scouting, good use of IPM principles. But we have a rating chart. There are differences in how these things perform, specifically on corn earworm. You need to understand their performance so you can manage appropriately, okay? You can read about that in the production guide. You can find it online, or your county agent has it in his office. <coughs> now, we were proactive last year. We actually had all the BT traits planted in 15 planes in mid -bit because we have concerns about what's happening in these other areas of the country. In all three of these locations, we had relatively low corn earworm pressure. And what I'm showing in this particular graph is the number of damaged bowls per acre. In the non-BT cotton that we never sprayed with insecticide, we only had about one damaged bowl every six feet. That's not bad, right? Don't, don't get the idea you can plant non-BT and not have a problem. But in these trials, we had relatively low pressure. Here's the how many bowls we saw in wide strike, about one every 19. Here's twin link. There's bowl guard two. Here's wide strike three, twin link plus, and bowl guard three. But you can see a difference. Wide strike just doesn't quite provide the level of control as the other big times, right? You can calculate percent control, and we know this. You just need to understand why strike is not as active on cornea worm as the other cottons, and just be prepared to treat them on a very timely basis. We've got some great wide strike varieties, but just understand they're not quite, they don't provide quite the level of control as the other two gene BT cottons uh, versus uh, when preparing with wide strike. And again, even under this light pressure, we still saw some damaged bowls even in the three gene stuff. So they're not immune. And what it takes for us to see a problem in the field is what? Numbers. You know, 70% 70 70 control of 10 leaves you three. 70% control of 100 leaves you 30. Then we have a problem, right? Just to tell you it's bad in some other areas, this is. Uh, some data from my colleague in North Carolina. And this just shows the difference in yield between the two gene versus the three gene counterpart. But again, those are significant differences in yield. So they had a lot more damage uh, in their BT cottons than we observed in Georgia. <coughs> it's interesting when you look at where the problems with corn earworm are, again, the Mid-South and North Carolina, Virginia, there's something common about those two areas that's different than Georgia. Does anybody know what that is? They've been spraying black bugs. That's number one. Number two is there's more corn production. So they have higher pressure. Again, sprays for plant bugs does what? Kills beneficial insects. It's so what pressure we have worse. And then they have a lot of corn. <coughs> So if we have corn earworms come through on BT cottons, you know, we're going to be scouting every acre. What are we going to do? Years, we've always sprayed pottery points. They've been very active compounds. That's what we're going to continue to do. But we need, do need to put a word of caution about pottery point efficacy and how they're going to perform on corn earworms. Every year <coughs> behind the scenes, we monitor susceptibility of corn earworm to pottery points. And the way we do that, is we put moths, these are corn earworm moths, put them in a small glass vial that's got a certain dose of insecticide on it, and we can look at survival. The more moths that survive that dose, in theory, the tougher they are to control with the polar application in the field. <coughs> what this chart represents is the percent survival over time, going all the way back to 2006. Now, when I look at this, the last four years have been kind of high, right? And I compare that to 2007, because in my career, 
That is the only year I remember us having field ethics and problems with my reports. And to me, these numbers are very similar to what we saw in 2007. So we just need to use some caution. So if we have to spray corn earworms, again, use a threshold. You gotta let the caterpillar size up give the technology a chance to work. But if he gets to a quarter inch in length, he's most likely going to survive on a BT cotton plant. But when using a pyrethroid, use high rates. We pretty much do that now. Just the economics of pyrethroids and insecticides. But it's been a long time since we really talked about the importance of coverage and penetration of the canopy. You know, when we're going after corn earworms, where are they going to be? They're not going to be up in the top of this plant. They're going to be down in blooms under bloom tags, you got to get the stuff down to the target. All right, so we need to start with pyrethroids. We need to follow up on these sprays. County agents are going to be doing this, but if you have any issues whatsoever, uh, you know, please let your county agent know. There are all alternatives to pyrethroids. Why don't we just use those? Well, we're talking less than $3 to more than 10 okay? So again, we'll start with pyrethroids, but we have other options and we'll make that move if we need to. Any questions on corn earworms? Okay. No questions. All right, Dr. Smith. So we, uh, we're we gonna spend the rest of time on white flies. But I really thought that BT cotton information was important. So Dr. Schmidt is actually uh, works with biological control. And when we think of white flies, uh, conservation of natural enemies is extremely important. But if we just really think about conservation of beneficial insects, it helps us with corn ear worm as well. So we've asked Dr. Schmidt to spend a little time uh, just uh, talking about natural control. Thank you. So uh, my name is Jason Schmidt. I'm here on the Tiffin campus um, of UGA, and I'll um, go over a few things and some of the things we've been uh, developing and working on in the lab since I got here just three years ago, actually. So I'm new to the cotton area, and I'll share some of the things we're working on. But Phil asked me to talk briefly about conservation and then about kind of putting a face to these uh, beneficials that are out there and what things we can do to, to keep them there and what are they actually doing for us. So that's what I've, that's what I've prepared, prepared today. So I've merged a few definitions to come up with a conservation definition for agriculture. And that is, it can be looked at as modifying the environment or existing practices to protect and enhance beneficial organisms that are out there doing some of that work for us. So the idea is not to, um, you know, not use the management tools that we have, but to use them when needed. Because out in the environment, there are a lot of uh, beneficial organisms that are actually doing that work for us. And if we're able to boost those populations, we likely will have to do less work. It's kind of the idea for agriculture. So how do we do that? So one way that we're um, that we're working on uh, developing in a few different ways is, uh, and, and many of you probably utilize this already, is uh, cover cropping. Um, cover cropping is a really easy in-field in uh, technique to take a system that looks like this and, and make it into an area that actually has habitat for uh, beneficial organisms to live. So in this setting, in the, when it's tilled at the end of the year and it's, it's waiting for the crop to be planted, there's really no homes uh, for beneficials uh, to live in. There's no place for them to be. And there's also other potential problems um, with erosion with a, with a pole tailor system. In a system with this heavy rye that's being used in, in many parts and, and, and other mixtures <laughs> they're developing, there are areas in there uh, for beneficials to live. Uh, which then can grow uh, early in the season. So the idea behind that uh, type of technology is that what we want to do is by having habitat there early in the season prior to planting, it allows for natural enemies to colonize there and provide uh, services early on before pest populations get out of control. Of course, 
if natural enemies did everything for us out there, we wouldn't have Wi-Fi problems and things like that. So the idea is we, we want to use that tool as much as we can and then and then subsidize with, with other technologies. It's not a it's not a one for all. So another so this got cut off a little bit. Another um, part of the conservation package is um, thinking about the design of a system prior to planting. So they, they labeled this, um, there's, a, there's a big literature on this called landscape design, and that is considering what are the options for putting in your fields. So at the very, kind of very, very basic uh, sort of scenario here, it would be there's no natural uh, habitat left. And there's only a very cut up um, area for agriculture. In that sort of setting, there's very few possibilities for those natural enemies to live. On the upper end here would be allowing for some complexity in, um, uh, in the landscape to provide areas for those beneficials to live. Now, there's a cost to this, of course, because it can't be overly uh, complex because then it's too hard to manage, right? You don't want to be driving the tractor around and bump into a tree or have half the thing, half of the uh, field in trees because that just makes it really difficult to manage. So there's a balance. But in general, by, by providing in that initial phase of establishment, providing some complexity, there's going to be a greater possibility for natural enemies and things like that to live and provide services later. So that would happen earlier on, and also can, can kind of happen um, uh, as restoring areas within the landscape. So that's at a very broad scale. So what, what are some of these um, predators out there, and uh, what do they look like, and when do they see them? Well, in that early part of the season, the main thing that, that you see out running around um, if you're out there, are spiders <coughs> and little beetles. They're out there running around. They'll eat on about anything. Um, and they're very, very diverse. So here's a little picture here. Uh, we're coming up with a little new manual uh, uh, for this in cotton. But if, can you see this little dot right here? That little dot is the size difference between some little spiders out there and these uh, bigger spiders out there. They are highly variable. So by the way, this is only three inches. We're not, we're not going to see uh, huge ones like that. That's just three inches. But highly variable. That means that they feed on different things uh, that are out there as well. Now, spiders are pretty cool. And I'm going to mention them again at the end. But they're cool because uh, they're diverse in where they forage. So having a diversity of them means that there's going to be a lot of little webs here, there, everywhere, where pests can fall into, run into, get stuck, and get eaten. So spiders are cool. This was supposed to come up later, but it ain't great. Right? There's about 600 spiders that are seen in, uh, in agriculture uh, in the United States. And a recent paper estimated the amount of prey or pests that they eat is somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 to 800 million tons. So they're important. <clears throat> later in the season, in that mid-season area between May up to September, there's a huge diversity of different things um, out there potentially. And some of these you may recognize. There's some jumping spiders again, there's some bugs, some lady, lady beetles, uh, some lace wings, um, some, some other flies here. This one here, you may not uh, recognize as well, but this is the larvae of this guy here, which is a spirit fly. He looks like this, and if you blow him up a little bit. So this little guy here looks like something you might not want, but this is an aphid muncher. They eat a lot of aphids, and they eat other little insects too. So they're good to have there, even though they don't look like something you might want. <clears throat> the other thing out there that is uh, beneficial and important for cotton are the pollinators. And there's a native one that I've, I've observed here called the two-spotted longhorn bee. They're this black bee, and they have long, they're called longhorns because they've got long antenna. Um, the other one I already mentioned is this spirit fly, which in its adult phase, which looks like this, um, it's a pollinator. In its uh, immature stage, that little wormy looking guy, that one is a predator. So it provides two functions um, by being there. You also see uh, honeybees. Now though cotton only needs a very small percentage um, of pollination, it still boosts yield by having those pollinators there. 
Um, and studies have shown it can improve. Also, you may have neighbors that you might collaborate with and produce honey from that very uh, uh, pollination service. So lastly, I want to start getting you all familiar with some of this, because what I want to understand in these systems is, okay, you have these predators out there, and what are they doing? Who's eating who? How are we changing that who's eating who based on our management? And how can we alter management to maximize that eating? So they're eating our pests for us. So here's what this represents. This is, a, this is a food web, and here's what this represents. On the top here, these are bars that represent different predators. And I've highlighted a few uh, uh, pretty important ones uh, that we see. On the bottom here, this represents some economical uh, uh, pests of interest and also what we would call alternative prey, some other uh, flies and things like that that are out in the, in the fields. <coughs> These ladybugs, we've all heard about quite a bit. You can see that this connection here represents what things they're actually eating out there. Ladybugs are eating aphids. We know that. They better be eating aphids out there. If those ladybugs aren't eating aphids out there, what are they doing? They're eating a lot of aphids. They also eat thrips, and they also eat white flats. What else is eating white flies? That's a topic of today. Well, if you follow this little arrow over here, spiders are eating white flies. There's likely some other little tiny uh, predators that are eating white flies, and there's also parasitoids that are eating white flies, but I don't have that on here. Um, spiders, notice, they're eating a lot of different prey out there, so they're providing services on a number of different pest groups um, in the system. Um, and we also have this one here. I think this is one of Philip Roberts' favorite uh, predators, is big-eyed bug or geocorus. And they're also eating quite a bit of aphids um, and other things uh, in the system. So keeping these in here and, and maintaining populations of beneficials, although maybe not helping with some target pests like uh, stink bugs, which here's my little stink bug here, very few things. Uh, find stink bugs, and I'm going to get kicked off of here. <coughs> um, very few things are eating stink bugs, but they're keeping these other things in check by being there. Um, so with that, I wanted to end with that. Spiders are awesome and eat tons and tons of uh, pests. And I want to thank a ton of people that have um, helped uh, with this work, and in particular, my uh, technician, Melissa Thompson, and support from the um, cotton So thank you. I don't know if I have time for questions. I think I'm going over. Questions for Dr. Schmidt. Again, conservation of beneficial insects is going to be very important if we, as we, if we deal with white flies, any kind of, but also going to help us a whole lot with cool air you know, Since we've had this great technology of BT Titan, we've probably drifted from IPM to think about <coughs> beneficial like we should. Have been. But it's a proven program, we know that, we just need to put it in action. Next is Dr. Mike Taves, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the biology, ecology type stuff on white flies, and then we'll really hammer in on, on management and what to do, what to expect for next year. All right, friends. So my goal is to kind of show you what happened over time and uh, try and put some biology behind that, and, and hopefully we can use that to manage what happens in the future here. So the slides that we've shown in the past, when Philip and I have gotten up in front of here, white flies have been a very sporadic pest. We saw them in 2008, you know, 15 we had a few more, 12, there's, there's some different years in there, and they generally start in the same kind of epicenter of the state here in uh, Tiff, Cockwood, and Marion. Um, we've talked about certain varieties and planting late, and that's really been the extent of it where it pops up every once in a while. That clearly was not the case this last year. Uh, and so we had widespread situations like this. This was out of my uh, field right here in Tiff County. It was planted on time with a semi sweet variety, well irrigated, and you can see that there's a lot of immatures coming through there. So one of those things that we want to talk about is, was this exactly the same? How did this change? So you've, a, a number of you have heard me talk about different systems we have for uh, tracking pests. This is our EDMAPS IPM. This is a uh, system that we developed right here in Tifton where our county agents can tell us on a weekly basis what's happening in their particular county. And so on white flies, what Philip would have said in the past is, if we see white flies in July, that means we may have problems in August. We don't even talk about it in May and June. So I'm going to start the uh, EDMAPS IPM, which means that all my county agents uh, are reporting on a, on a uh, weekly basis as to what's happening. The dark blue means there's nothing. And it's May. Is Scott Carlson in here? 
Scott Carlson lights this up and says, hey, there's white flies. This is the end of May. This, this should not be happening. June 5, <clears throat> we've got lots not going on. Tiff County still appears to have a few things happening. So we start getting into June. Fred Hicks up in Scraven County. Hey, we've got a few white flies up here. Again, completely unprecedented for what we've seen in the past. We start moving through uh, June. Camera County's in. Okay, well, there's another vegetable production region up here, and that's something we're going to come back to. So we're getting into later June. We start adding Eccles and Grady, and it's obvious to those of us that follow this very closely, as well as each of you as producers, that something very definitely has changed. And so you're going to see this thing light up as we go through June, we get into July, and this would be historically when we might start to see a few. Absolutely nothing near economic levels, but we're getting into July, and if you look at this, we've got a handful of counties already in the southern part of the state that are saying, hey, we've definitely got white flies this year. Then we start looking at uh, when are we going to start making treatment. So in our system, we allow the county agents to say, yes, white flies are present, and hey, we've started treating in certain fields. Scott Carlson lights up Tiff County, July 10th. In past years, we may or may not have even seen a, a few white flies. Scott Carlson says, hey, we're making treatments right here in Tiff County. Let's move forward. All right, we're making lots of treatments in Tiff County, and these other neighboring areas, Tiff, Irwin, Turner, Mitchell, Terrell, we're making applications as well. Completely unprecedented for what we've seen in previous years. So as we move forward, you're going to see this map start to fill in. What I want you to look at is anything that's a change in color. Dark blue means not reported. <clears throat> Everything else, uh, red, orange, this, this kind of lighter orange, means yes, we're making treatments. And so we, we're uh, into July here, and then we get into August, and this thing just absolutely blows up on us. And so it goes across a region right in here, which happens to be our cotton production belt. We get into later August. And you see that we are just filling in counties and we're treating field after field. And it's not a single application like it's been in the past. It's multiple applications. And Phillip's got some estimates on, on yield losses. Uh, this is really, really a scary story. So here's, here's the last map I'm going to show. So I'll just walk you through the entire summer. But you see that we've got uh, a number of, of uh, counties in there. We have the majority of the, of the uh, fields are being treated. There are some new, there is some nuance with um, planting date, for example. There's still all the things in play about dry land versus irrigated, smooth versus hairy cultivars. All those things are still in play, but the overall level of white pipe pressure was so much higher in 2017 that it overwhelmed what typically um, would have been good practices. All right, so to understand this from a biological perspective, uh, when you dig through the literature and start studying white flies, they're an invasive insect. Many of you have heard me talk about invasives. They're, they're not native to North America. Uh, they tend to be more severe in subtropical regions of the world where cotton and vegetables are grown in close proximity. Fridge right here is the map of vegetable production intensity by color, with red being the, the uh, most intense, blue a little bit less, and then gray, of course, being our, our less uh, vegetable intense counties. Going across the state, notice that belt right in there. The cotton crop is the same thing, going from white to dark blue, most intense production region right through here. Notice how they overlap. These are the same white flies that were getting started in vegetables, we're getting really going in the summer, and then we're transferring those back to vegetables in the fall. And guess what? We've got vegetables and different types of crops in our fields year-round that are good hosts. All right, so we talked about the white fly life cycle. Um, little eggs that many of you don't see unless you're looking with a magnifying glass. They tend to be in that little horseshoe shape because the female stays put, just goes around in a circle, deposits those eggs. The first instar comes out, that's what we call the crawler stage. That is the only stage that's mobile. They go find a really nice place on the bottom side of that leaf and plug in. So after that first instar molts, there's no legs, that, that uh, immature cannot move. They plug right into the phloem and start pulling that phloem out, which is sucking the plant down. We go through a couple of different instars, all in the exact same place. Uh, many of you are familiar by the time we get to that uh, fourth instar, that's when you can see the little red eyes, and then the adult's gonna merge out of there little teeny teeny tiny guy about a, a uh, <clears throat> millimeter long all right so a little bit on biology adults live uh not quite two weeks to about three weeks so we've got a fairly long period in there uh females make within hours of emerging and they can start laying eggs within one day of emerging incredibly high reproductive potential uh each female lays 50 to 400 the mean is about 200 eggs 
per female. So you start thinking about the generation potential as we get more and more generations at hot temperatures into the summer. And you can see how this blows up on us very quickly. Another thing we got working against this is the sex ratio. It's about three to one. Three females per one male out of every egg clutch. Uh, the generation time is temperature dependent like all insects, but under typical summertime temperatures here, we're looking about three weeks. And then we have that entire increase. When I say average of 200, that's the number of eggs. You've got to figure that over half of those are going to survive. Now, Jason's got good data on some predation. Hopefully, we're getting some natural control in there. There's some level of mortality you know, that naturally occurs. We've got a fungus potentially in the system. But we're still looking at increased rates of, say, 40 to 50x per generation. Well, every three weeks, that spins out of control very, very quickly. Adults can fly several miles. Now, there's a dispersal phase. If they get up into a wind, if a hurricane comes through, they're going to blow a lot of miles. There's no question about that. But just trivial flight can be up to a mile or two for a white fly. So there's no field that's spatially uh, isolated enough that, that we're going to escape pressure. Really, really key stuff in here. <coughs> All right, known hosts. White flies have about 500 known hosts. It'll be tough for us to say, well, we'll just keep the right one out of the ground at the right time. Includes row crops, vegetables, and ornamentals. And the vegetables are crops that we commonly grow in Georgia. Cucurbit, snap beans, yellow squash, pepper, tomatoes. Uh, those coal crops that are going through over the winter. And then, of course, cotton and soybean are great hosts. Notice the populations on here. Incredible populations in 2017 that all of you saw. All right, so this is what I really want to, to focus in on then. From a standpoint of management, this is what we're facing at this point. We have increasingly diverse cropping systems, and we provide year-round hosts for this particular insect. So yes, it's an invasive. It does all these things in terms of uh, producing lots of offspring. It's tilted against us in a lot of ways. But we also produce all the different crops at any given point in time. So if you were to think about, I'm, I want to draw lines from top to bottom of this graph, and my goal is to find a point in the year where that line does not intersect any commonly grown crop in this part of the state, which you find very quickly is that we don't have that. I didn't talk a lot about weeds, but there are a number of weeds that, that are good uh, white fly hosts. We're at this point, we're trying to sift out which ones are really the most important in our area. I mean, there's data from other parts of the uh, country and the world, but we've got to figure that out on our end. But, you know, our greenhouse transplants, we know that white flies can survive in greenhouses very well. Historically, we thought that's where they got started. I think there's ample evidence, if you walk outside right now, that a lot of our coal crops are just loaded up with white flies. We kill the adults with cold weather. We're not necessarily killing the immatures. We get into our spring crops. We've got all these vegetables. And, of course, our, our row crops, cotton and soybean, really provide the majority of the, the acreage where these populations increase. And then, lo and behold, if you're trying to grow fall vegetables, all these populations are getting transferred. I'm moving out a lot of minor crops over, relatively minor crops in terms of acreage. Um, and we're shifting all those over there, and then we're keeping that cycle going. So this is something that we've got to investigate. We've got to get a feel for what are the most important crops, you know, what are the practices that allow us to break this life cycle where we can. And it's going to start with this kind of stuff. All right, uh, last thing I'm going to say then is the uh, white fly monitoring network that we've got up right now. Um, because of the problems that we had, we've invested a significant amount of resources in 2018 to try and study exactly what's happening in a large area. So this is the uh, white fly trapping monitoring uh, network that I've got put in right now. We've got 125 traps uh, in this area that goes all the way from Vidalia down to uh, Dothan, Alabama. Uh, every week we run that, it's about 800 miles. We've got a postdoc, a perba barman. A perba, raise your hand. I want everybody to take a good look at a perba. He's a little skinny guy right now. And next year, after 40,000 miles, he's going to be a lot bigger because that's a lot of seat time. So <laughs> perba barman is my hero right now. Every week, he's driving this 800-mile loop along with the help from a lot of folks in my lab. Um, and we're changing these white fly cards. Who thinks there's any white flies out there at all? We've had all these freezes. Anybody think there's any white flies left right now? Yeah. Yeah, uh, probably more than I would have guessed. I'm a little uncomfortable with that. I still think we're going to be fine in 2018, by the way. Uh, very different conditions in terms of the overwintering, um, but they're still persisting out there. It's that green bridge concept, and the immatures uh, can, can, be, can be sheltered, and they're not dying nearly as easy as the adults are. All right, so I do want to throw out uh, funding for this kind of stuff. It comes from the commission. Uh, got incorporated. I've got a number of industry partners that always help us out. Uh, and folks in my lab, this is a, a picture that we took this fall. A number of those folks are right in this room. In fact, you're in my lab, raise your hand. 
these are folks that are putting in a lot of seat time, y'all. Um, really, really appreciate the help that they do, and uh, we will go forward. I'll have a lot more data for you next year. Philip. I have some questions for Mike. How are you post the monitor? Come again? Are you going to post the monitor? Yeah, so, so the the, uh, the maps that I showed you on a countywide basis on what happened in 2017, our goal then will be put that up. Uh, that'll go on to an extension blog as to the activity that we're seeing in particular areas. What we'll do is just light it up by county again. Could you comment on basically on making your determination about spraying and that kind of thing? Because I think a lot of people didn't realize, they didn't understand how this whole concept works versus dark versus getting pure. So they didn't, they didn't know what to look for. Yeah, so, so the question then is, when do we initiate? We know we've got to be early and all that. I'm going to punt all that to Philip because he's got slides on that. He's the one that kind of leads the implementation in the field. My part is the biology. Philip does the implementation. When we get done, I'll be happy to you know, individually address questions. But key points that we've got to talk about. <coughs> Cotton's where it's at. <laughs> I, I don't have a good answer for you whether it's playing, some playing chemistry or... Here, here's something to think about. I don't know if this is a great answer, but something to think about. White flies love soil beans. If anybody planted some soil beans behind the corn late July or August, they would love them. What's the leak pubescence of the soil bean? What's the leak pubescence of the peanut? And that helps us understand the pubescence in cotton. Now, we say they don't like peanuts, but they're in peanuts. And when we plant 750,000 acres of peanuts, that's going to be part of this equation because as we manage white flies long term, this is an agricultural problem, whether you're a vegetable grower or cotton grower, it doesn't matter. We all have to work together. So peanuts is going to be an important part of that bridge as these white flies make the circle. But uh, anyway. <coughs> Let me start and then Glenn will make sure we get the. Was that Glenn that asked the question? Yes. Look, some of you have been at the county meetings. I showed this slide and I've tried to change it up a little bit. But white flies impact cotton in two ways. Number one, yield. They're stress inducing. They're sucking the plant, sucking the nutrient from the plant. We see a general leaf decline, and if you fail to do anything, you can drop leaves. You're not going to properly fill holes. They're yield limiting pests. You know, part of my job is just to convince people that it was a yield limiting pest. It was. The other way white flies impact cotton is potentially impact quality. White <coughs> flies excrete honeydew. Honeydew can accumulate on the lip. High sugar content in the honeydew. <coughs> potentially in the spinning process it can become sticky and reduce efficiency at a meal. That's an important thing for us to think about as an industry. You don't need the reputation <coughs> of having uh, potential problems in terms of stickiness. We in the state of Georgia grow as good a cotton as any place in the world. We have a desired cotton. We need to maintain that reputation. Absolutely, education needs to win. You know, it's hard to educate an industry in a matter of weeks. You know, we tried to do what we could. Uh, as far as when to spray, it's all about initiating sprays to minimize infield reproduction <clears throat> and uh, targeting on the immature white flies on the bottom of that fifth leaf. But uh, we've got a lot more information in your uh, production guide this year. Our county agents are going to be much better trained to help us address this issue. So we learned a lot <laughs> in extension. You learned a lot on the farm. But again, a lot of education is still needed. And again, when we talk about managing white flies, uh, you're going to hear myself and Stormy. You know, Mark, Mike talked about the green bridges. You know, uh, one of the things we saw this year is we had these hot pockets, you know, really blow up a long ways from Tipton, but a lot of times they were associated where we had some watermelons or cantaloupes. White flies weren't a pest in those crops but they built numbers that infested cotton. Uh, one of the things that myself and Dr. Sparks, our vegetable entomologist, are going to be talking more about is destroying host plants, crops that could build white flies as soon as harvest is over. 
That could be a watermelon producer, it could be a cantaloupe producer, it could be you as a cotton producer. We send a lot of white flies back to fall vegetable production, and it was a disaster, just to be straight up, uh, the last two years in parts of Georgia. But it's something we all have to work together on. There's no question, early detection is so critical. Early detection and action. You know, part of the problems, uh, when we are really triggering thresholds, you don't see a visible problem in the field, for the most part. You all agree with that? I mean, there's not, you know, you can't say we're getting eat up, but we're at that threshold point. Uh, but early detection, you know, can help us to better conserve beneficial insects, avoid using some products prone to flare white flies and make them worse. But again, that threshold is very early in this development cycle. But as I'm going to show you in a minute, the reproductive or the infestation rate in the field is very gradual and then all of a sudden it spikes up. And we're trying to treat right before that spike. And this slide illustrates that. This red line, solid red line, is the number of immature white flies per leaf. That dotted red line at the bottom is our threshold. At this particular field here on the station in Tifton, on the 17th of July, we didn't have any immature white flies. The 24th, we picked up a few. By the 31st, we exceeded threshold. But one week after we exceeded threshold, it was out of control. And again, one week after threshold, it was out of control. We saw the problem, but we were late. And uh, if you get behind this pest, it's hard to catch up. Uh, this is yield data from that same field of cotton. just shows different weeks where we initiated control of white flies. And we eliminated white flies <coughs> once we began spraying. I aggressively treated them with insecticide. But where we sprayed threshold, is right here, the bars to the left, we initiated one week prior to threshold, two weeks prior to threshold. The good news is there was no advantage to being more aggressive than our current threshold. See that? Those yields are basically the same. The problem is every week we were late initiating or eliminating white flies, we lost 80 pounds of cotton in this field. That's serious. That's what the data showed in this, this field. One trial. That's not that <coughs> all over Georgia, but we do know you've got to be on time because it's hard to catch up. Irma did a lot of bad things for Georgia Cotton. There's no question. As you go back and think about things, think about my little world white flies. And Dr. Taves and Dr. Smith, our little world of insects. What happened to the white flies after the hurricane? Oh, go on. I don't know what we would have done if we had to fight white flies in October. Mike mentioned a fungus. There was a fungus, and Michael, we looked at some of that. That's the name of it up there on the right. I can't say it. But, uh, but you know, I don't know where we would have been. So that's I think it's both physical and the fungus came in too. I mean, we've seen hurricanes come through. Oh, uh, <coughs> hold on. Back, back to your name. Never too fast. Just physical damage or <coughs> destruction of the adults. But we've seen hurricanes come through and they, and they bounce right back. But the fungus had more to deal with. Listen, we've got five minutes left, and uh, I don't want to keep uh, just talking randomly. I want, I want us to, uh, have, if you have any questions, I want to address them. But again, I'm going to point you to the production guides. The county agent has those. You can find them on ugacotton.com. Uh, but we talked a lot about risk factors in the production guide. This is just an example of some of the things. Uh, that we think are going to influence uh, our risk associated with white flies this upcoming year. Um, I feel optimistic 
that we've hit the reset button is the term I like to use and we're kind of back to a normal situation. Uh, you know, winter kill is one thing, mortality in the winter months. But another consideration is the type of temperatures we have in early spring. You know, in 2017, we actually completed an extra generation of white flies by the 1st of April than what we typically do. So there's a lot of things that go into this. And you know, trying to outguess and predict insects can be, be kind of tough. But I know we, we, we got to do that. Any questions? <coughs> so that's the million dollar question. Um, you know, if you notice the loop that Herman uh, and Mike are making with the white fly traps, we're concerned about that area around Cannon's uh, Tombs, Canberra. That was a that was a pocket that really fired up quick this year. Uh, we think brassica type crops are an important cultivated host right now this coming year and that production is grown in that area so we still look at this tip talkwood area but, you know maybe that's a new area um, how are the current population are they higher than the previous one well, I don't think there's any doubt that the winter population last year was considerably higher. You know, Philip said that it was an extra generation. We didn't have a lot of freezing weather, y'all, last year until the big freeze because we got our beaches. We've had good cold weather this year. I don't have trapping data last year to compare with, but our, you know, the general bias is I think we're quite a bit lower this year than we were last year at this time. I think that another observation is I see some folks who check vegetables as well as cotton in here. But last spring, we were treating white flies in vegetable, our spring vegetable crop, almost like we treated them in the fall, which is very unusual. It's not unusual to have white flies on vegetables in the spring, but it was unusual to have to be that aggressive with them on the spring crop. So we're going to know if it's coming. Now, if it is, there's a lot of risk factors, you know. I'm optimistic about the temperature so far, but um, you know, there's things like planting smooth leaf varieties. You know, if we see these crop flies and we have a feeling they're coming, let's don't plant much cotton in June. Let's try to move up and plant some earlier to avoid some of this. So there's a lot of things we can do proactively to manage risk if we need to. Other questions? Immatures, we need over 50 hours at 21 degrees. I don't think it has to be consecutive, and I don't, don't hold me to it. We've killed the adults. I feel pretty comfortable. And one good thing that's happened this year is we had two distinct cold periods. So I went back and looked at weather data for the last 15 years, and one year we took white flies down to nothing, and that was from 14 to the 15 crop. And in that year, we had three cold periods, about three or four weeks apart. We kill every adult, let some of the immatures on some warm days come back out, then we kill them again. <clears throat> you know, so that's what has happened so far. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but we, we haven't had the temperatures to kill any immature. But we're killing adults as they come out. 57 at 21 degrees. 57 miles. Yep. Well, that species of fungus has been commercialized, but what happens, and Dr. Taves can help me, there are different strains. Like you may have the same fungus, but a certain strain may be more active on one pest than another pest, but that fungus itself uh, has been commercialized. Think of it not like that strain. Think of it like in the <coughs> We got influenza every year, but certain years it's a whole heck of a lot worse than other ones. That's the way the strain on the fungus works. That particular isolate, so I, we sent that off to the pathogen uh, person, got it identified, and then he immediately tested it next to the commercial strain. Coming back and goes, man, that stuff's awesome. Where can I get some more of that? That was what was blown around in the environment after the hurricane. So, you know, where do you go with that? Well, so we saw it first. Yep. The tide tide. Yep. And then a month later, it did a lot in that yep. area. Yes. And then it disappeared. 
I mean, you know what I'm saying? They started building in, that, in those fields, and then we found it at the end of the season. Yep. And so, I, I, it, I mean, it, I was, you know, I guess my thought is that if we had a product where we all spray it, the season would be done. Maybe even in Dutch, is that, is that something that um, would help, I mean, hurt those crops as far as rotting them? I wouldn't, think way outside the box here. I wouldn't think you could uh, hurt the crop because I think it's so specific to the insect itself. Yeah, no, I, I think it has zero effect on the host. It's very specific to the insects. Of course, the insect is a you know a living, breathing entity, and, and there's gene mixing, and there's some change in gene frequency, and the pathogen has some change in gene frequency. And what you need is lightning in a bottle, which is I think what we got this last year. Now, whether it will continue at that same level of pathogenicity is unknown, but very clearly the one that y'all found. Really, really good. All right. One, one more follow-up on this fungus. Myself or Storm and Sparks, we've never seen that in the state of Georgia until this past year. I mean, I hope it comes back. But it's not something we count. And I don't know if we just have the perfect environment for it to take. But, you know, we had enough white flies. And any time you get too many people in a small place or too many anything, like too many people in this little dinky room, we can uh, tend to get hot, you know, and get sick. <laughs> anyway, uh, one final thing. Anyone interested in <coughs> credits? You know the drill, green is commercial, white is private. Can you touch on one thing? Too? Yep. The importance of going to the fifth league to find injury? Absolutely. There's a reason we look at the fifth league. Most of the eggs are laid at the very top of the plan. You have a plant that's growing, you've got to give enough time for those eggs to hatch so they're visible. So that's why we come down to a certain spot on the plant. Okay, because you want to know where the action is. Where, and if you would have started and looked at the second leaf, third leaf, fourth leaf, fifth leaf, most of the time when you first see them, the plant's growing, is the fifth leaf. And that's what we want to know now. We had cotton planted in June that's just screaming and growing rapidly. Sometimes you have to come down to the sixth leaf, but, uh, but there's, it's a, a reason we do that. And again, if you're, when the plant's still actively growing and you're applying controls, it's kind of like sampling bowls for stink bugs. You gotta get a different leaf or a post treatment account on that, you know, that didn't, don't have old cadavers or old damage on it. So it's very important. One quick question. Is it true to, I heard rumors that some varieties, I think it's more that way, some varieties, at one point, that maybe, you know, there's certain varieties that I didn't have a lot of crop pressure on that. Y'all followed up on any of that? I don't know about, you know, something that I dramatic. I understand the right? Yeah. But the hairy smooth leaf, there's no question. There was also a lot to planting date. Once it got to a certain maturity level, it didn't seem to be nearly as attractive. And I, I think that can get found into a variety as well. Yeah. And you know, it's just like, you know, as bad as they were in Tifton, <coughs> you know, I had cotton planted in April. I put five ounces of NAC on twice, and that's all I did. The cotton was clean as a whistle. But it got to a point just from planting date, it just wasn't attractive, even though we had an onslaught of white flies. And I may have had some cotton planted in the maize brook that needed four applications. You know, I asked, when I asked about the black variety, and I've asked some of the guys on one on one, but is there a reason why it's harder for the seed to be in the field? Um, is that hard for the seed guys to do? Is that going to be in the takes a lot of investment, okay? And uh, I believe if there was uh, enough demand to have something for white flies, like there was to have something to back a bud worm, that's something I didn't mention on BT Cottons. It's still 100% on the back of bud worm, we can never forget that. Uh, but just, I just don't think there's enough demand to really commit to the millions and millions of dollars to bring that out. Now in the coming years, maybe that changes. Is there a resistance or tolerance trait that's been identified? Not that I'm aware of. All right. Don't forget your pesticide credits and uh, 